to begin our webinar on the accumulation of dry matter during the growth, development, and ripening of mango, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jorge Alberto Osuna Garcia. Dr. Jorge Alberto is an agronomer. He's an engineer. He graduated from the Autonomous University of Sinaloa. He has a master's in botany, and he also studied post-harvest at the University of State, New Mexico University. He has been working since 1981. And he works with the campus in Santiago Escuincla in Nayarit, Mexico. He received the Dean's Award of Excellence in New Mexico State University for the best GPA in 1996. In addition, he is a researcher class one and NSE. Since 1998, he has won the Nayarit Medal four times for scientific and technological research, and he was also awarded with the Best Paper Award in the 8th Summit of Mango in Sand City, South Africa in 2006. Dr. Osuna has published 11 books regarding post-harvest technology, over 50 scientific articles, 27 that were extensive articles, and he has a, an additional 16 technical publications. He has also worked with different theses, and he has advised different degrees of thesis. He researches post-harvest, food safety of tropical fruits, mainly mango and avocado. Welcome, Dr. Osuna. Thank you very much, Vlad. Good afternoon, everyone. It's truly a pleasure for me to be here with you again. It's too bad that we still have to do these type of seminars remotely, and hopefully we will meet in person once again in the future. Thank you to the National Mango Board for these last 10 years that we have been working together. And just like Vlad said, today I'm going to discuss information from 2020 to 2021. If you allow me, I'm going to share my screen. And just like Vlad mentioned, I am going to talk to you about the dry matter accumulation during growth, development, and the ripening of mango. Let me start by saying that mango is one of the most important fruits in the American market, where we talk of a value of over $635 million per year and a little over 120 million boxes of 10 pounds that export are exported. As you can see in this graph, Mexico is the main country that exports mango to the United States. We take over 65% of the market. We also have the Tommy Atkins variety, Ataulfo, Kent. Those are the top three varieties. And as you can see, they all have different percentages. We also find them in Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, Guatemala, etc. With the exception of Haiti, because Haiti has the Madame Francis variety, which is uh, original to that area. I would like for you to remember this phrase, maturity at harvest, determines eating quality. We know that the quality must be produced in the field through all practices 
from a flowering to the pest control, illness control, fertilization, irrigation, etc. But the quality could be spoiled at the time in which we determine the harvest. So please pay attention to this phrase. And let me say, how do we know when the fruit is ready to be harvested? We talk about size, shape, color of the fruit. We talk about the development of the shoulders, the formation of the cavity at the base of the peduncle. And if we see those little spots, those are lenticels. And if they are bigger, in the case of Ataulfo, we see that the cheeks are rounded. And then we say that this fruit is full or when it's low, it's the opposite. So these are some characteristics that allow us to determine when the fruit is ready for harvest. And we see that experience plays a big role. For those who don't have a lot of experience, we need some quantitative numbers. Out of all the variables, the most important ones are the pulp color and the prix content of the fruit. For example, let's talk about Kent. If I have one that is ready for harvest, it has a 7.4 bricks and a color level two. What does that mean, that color? Let's look at this table and you can see the different colors. For Hayden and for the five varieties, we have a value of one, two, or three. What does number one mean? As you can observe here, once you cut it right at the level, level of the seed, what do we see? We see the pulp that doesn't have any color whatsoever. It's a very green fruit. And if we were to harvest it like that, and if we were to send it to the market, we won't meet the requirements of all the consumers because that mango is not going to develop flavor, aroma, color, and we would be affecting the market. When we talk about a level two color, if you look at it here, this is the pretty much the seed, and you can see that the color is different for any of the varieties. So this is the time. This is the minimum that is acceptable. The fruit is physiologically ripe for it to continue to ripen after it is harvested. And I would say that number three is the level that we really want to seek. We see that the color is a uniform color in any of the five varieties. Well, so we are talking that mango is a climateric fruit. What does that mean? It means that once the fruit has been harvested, if it was harvested when it was ready or if it was mature, these fruit is going to continue with its ripening process so that it gets to the consumer in the best possible way. That means that it requires a 7.4 bricks and a level two pulp color. And with that, it would get to the consumers and within between 18, 19, or about 20 degrees bricks. So that means that it continues the ripening process. But what happens when the product is exported far away, then sometimes they decide to harvest when the fruit is green. And at least they should comply with the level that we analyzed before, which is level two. So what happens when some of the fruits are harvested under level two? Well, they won't have the quality, the flavor that the consumer requires. And they will judge the ripeness of the fruit based on the firmness, the color of the pulp, the skin, the soluble 
matter, the dry matter, and even the aroma. And like I said in the beginning, the quality to the consumer depends in the state of the ripeness at harvest time. And we need to be able to differentiate if the fruit is not mature enough or if it's ready from a physiological aspect. Why? Because an unripe fruit will never reach its maximum quality. We saw that the color of the pulp is a good indicator to that maturity. However, we have to cut the cheek of the fruit to analyze the color of the pulp and then decide if it is ready or not. Recently, we've seen indications that dry matter is a more accurate variable. And so what is dry matter? Well, dry matter is the entire content of the fruit minus the water that can be extracted. So there are organic acids, carotenoids, sugars, etc. And what is the relative advantage? Well, that it can be measured in a non-destructive manner. In fact, in some mango producing countries such as Australia, the primary varieties, Kensington Pride and others, reach their harvest point at a minimum of 15% dry matter. But so that would be equivalent to stage three. In Mexico, that amount of dry matter is not considered an indicator for maturity at harvest. However, with the support of the National Mango Board, we have done some work using different levels of accumulation of heat matter, or rather heat units, we have been able to determine dry matter for Tommy Atkins, Ataulfo, Kent, and Kit. And we are also going to look at these uh, values in more detail. So that's how this project came about. And the objective of this project is to evaluate the impact of dry matter at harvest on fruit quality for consumers and also relate this to heat units. We would like to be able to correlate heat units with dry matter in order to achieve better quality at consumption. And also, evaluate the different techniques using heat units, which is destructive, and dry matter, which is non-destructive, uh, in mangoes for export from Mexico. In this study, we used an F751 spectrometer in order to determine dry matter of different varieties. And in this case, using a single model. So what did we do? In 2020, we did this uh, for two years. The 2020 season, we worked with two commercial growing areas in Nayarit and Sinaloa. We worked with Adolfo Tommy Atkins, Kent and Keat. We first looked at heat units, the accumulation of heat units, which consists in placing a temperature monitor in a tree in the orchard in order to monitor those temperatures and send that data to an Excel spreadsheet in order to calculate the heat units using 10 degrees centigrade as the reference temperature and also looking at the moment of maximum flowering. In terms of dry matter, we took measurements every three weeks, starting at 50 days after full flowering, using the instrument that I mentioned previously. And then we did this with three different harvests, which would be the equivalent of the minimum maturity 
the a more mature fruit and also the ideal level. And so we used 40 stems and we also labeled them individually in order to follow the growth of the fruit and the accumulation of the dry matter up until the determined point of harvest. So we measured different variables, length, diameter, size, dry matter. We also considered quality at the time of harvest. We also simulated transportation to the US uh, with refrigeration and also the point of consumption. So we looked at what the consumer sees, which is total solu soluble solids uh, and external color, firmness, et cetera. In 2021, we did something similar, but uh, in this case, in the previous cycle, we noticed that it wasn't necessary to monitor dry matter after the 50 days and up to just before harvest. During that time, the fruit is accumulating dry matter, so it's not necessary to be following it that closely. So we just did took three samples of dry matter prior to harvest and at two points, harvest points with fruit with the minimum level of maturity and then the ideal level. We worked with six trees and it was a similar procedure. We also measured similar variables. And here now in 2021, we had also worked on a single model, on creating a single model in order to create a model that could predict the dry matter content of any of the four primary varieties of mangoes for export from Mexico or the producing countries. So Adolfo, Tommy, Kent, and Keith. So what did we do to create this model? Well, we did it with the four different varieties and we took into account lots of 40 pieces of fruit each where we worked with immature fruit, fruit at three, at stage three, and then completely uh, colored fruit. These 200 pieces of fruit were scanned with a F70 spectrometer, which is a piece of, an, of equipment that is experimental and that allows us to build these models. And F751 is uh, simply a reader that is more accessible for growers and packers. So we had the 200 pieces of fruit and the instrument would take a reading, like a photograph, this F751, and would store it in memory and then we were able to determine the heat or rather dry matter with an oven, it required uh, much more time. And the soluble solids were measured with a digital refractometer as well. Once we had the information from the readings with the reference values, the software allowed us to create a model. And for that purpose, we used this application art from Artificial Neural Network. So what did we do to commercially confirm this instrument, this technology? Well, we used two commercial orchards for each variety in Nayarit and Sinaloa and we monitored the dry matter, particularly at the time of harvest. And it was something similar to what we did in the experimental phase. 
So the dry matter commercially, uh, what did we do? Well, with the support of the National Mango Board, we determined the necessary heat units for each of the varieties. For example, here we see that we have Kents and for Kents, we need 1800 heat units to be at level two on the that we saw on the table and 1950 for maturity level three. So what did we do? Well, we combined the heat unit technique with the spectrometer F751 to be able to predict the dry matter of the fruit at the time of harvest. As we were saying, Adolfo and Tommy Atkins require 1,600 to 1,750 heat units, Kent up to 1,950, and Keat 2,200 to 2,400 heat units. So this technology has been fully validated. It has been transferred to the growers, and uh, we're at 100% with it. So what we're doing now is combining this technology with a non-destructive method to make it even more efficient. So here we have the, well, as we said, the dry matter was measured with a forced air oven at for 72 hours at 60 degrees. So what were the results? So I'm going to present the content with regard to growth and then the quality of the fruit. And then finally, I'm going to present information about the validation of the spectrometer. So in 2020, what did we see here? So we have growth in length for Adolfo, for Tommy, for Kent, for Keat, and in both growth states, and development in the commercial orchards of the fruit, both in Nayarit, that is represented here by the blue line, and in Sinaloa, which is represented here by the orange line. So there are differences between states. And the most important thing here is that with a greater accumulation of heat units, you can see here that starting around 1,100 heat units, we have a value that is increasing and is maintained or goes up slightly with greater heat units from 1,500 to 1,700, we have a longer fruit. And uh, we have this information for Tommy and Keith. Unfortunately for 2020, we were not able to get this information for Kent in Nayarit, but we see the same tendency. With greater heat units, we see greater growth, fruit growth. If we look at the diameter of the fruit, we see a very similar trend. So what do we see in fruit growth? Well, mango fruit during the three last weeks of growth is when it might reach 50 or 60 additional grams per fruit. So we are used to, well, depending on the market demand, when market is asking for ataulfo, uh, the market wants ataulfo, whether it's ripe or not, or ready for harvest. So let's say we're looking at 1500 heat units. So what are we doing? We're losing some diameter. We're losing in weight between 50 and 60 grams of weight. And that's uh, very similar for all four varieties. So what do we see in terms of the evolution of dry matter? So here you can see Kent, just in Sinaloa, with more heat units we see a greater accumulation of dry matter. This 
is true generally for the four varieties. And how is this represented at the time of harvest? Look, this is very interesting. We have all of this data. We have Ataulfo, we have size at harvest. What does size mean? Well, if I have a size 10, it means that in a box of 10 pounds, I have 10 pieces of fruit. So what does that mean? Well, I have pieces of fruit that are approximately 450 grams each. If I have 12 pieces of fruit in the same box, then they will be individual pieces of fruit of approximately 400 grams. And so we can see here, the higher or the larger the size of the fruit, the greater the weight. So what do we see here with 1600 heat units? We see a much higher percentage of size 14 fruit. What does that mean? That means they're smaller fruit. And when we harvest at 1700 fruit units or rather heat units, which represents seven to 10 days to get from 1600 to 1700 heat units, we only need to leave seven, the fruit on the tree for seven to 10 additional days. And what happens? Then we see larger fruit size and greater weight. That 70 to 80 grams that the fruit gains in the last two or three weeks are reflected here. And we see the size of fruit that is smaller here. So the greater the heat units, uh, the bigger the fruit. And that trend is in general for the four varieties for Ataulfo, Tommy, Kent, and Keat. Well, what happened uh, when it came to quality issues? We see here that one of the values that we use is the pulp color. Now, what do we have here? What we're most interested here is uh, the value for the consumer. We have, actually, let me explain this better, what uh, the lines mean. Well, pulp color means that the lower the value, the higher the pulp color or the more intensity in color. What we have here is with 1500 heat units and we have other food that doesn't have that much color and it goes to 1700 heat units. That's when it goes greater. So in general, those were the trends, both for Ataulfo from Sinaloa and Ataulfo from Nayarit. So what do we have here? The um, higher the heat unit, the more intense the pop color at the time of consumption. And what happens with the um, solid um, soluble solids content we have? Uh, 1500 and we have fruit with 1600 or 1700 they actually show a different value uh, for the consumer which again is the most important thing so what we see here is this trend uh, so the higher the heat units that are accumulated or the higher content on dry matter the higher content of um, soluble solids for consumption. Now, when it comes to the acidity, what do we have here? We see that in the beginning of the harvest, while uh, you have um, fruit that is unripe, then it implies that it's more acidic. So we have 1500, 1600, and 1700. And the difference here is not as important at time of consumption, but it is important at time of harvest. So we have the relationship between the acidity and bricks. That's the relationship between the uh, sweetness and the acidity of the product. And which is what we see here very clearly. So the higher 
heat units, uh, the higher the relationship between bricks and the acidity. We have 1500, 1600, and 1700. So that is what we see for Ataulfo, and we have it also for Tommy, which was basically a copy of everything else in duplicate, pretty much. And we don't see significant differences between the values but not in the trends. So the trends are basically the same. So the higher heat units, the more intensity of the color of the fruit, the higher the content of solid, um, soluble solids at harvest. And we saw that uh, with Tommy and we saw it also with Kent. Uh, we had it in Sinaloa. Look at the uh, pop color here, 1650, 1800, 1950 heat units. And look at the difference at the time of harvest. Uh, there are more units of uh, heat units and that translates into a um, more intense pulp color. And we see here also with the soluble solids, which are higher at 1950 and at 1800 heat units. But here you can see that at Taulfo and Tommy, they have certain requirements for, for heat and it changes. It's not 1600 anymore. It's 1650, 1800, and 1950 heat units. For kit, we saw, and um, if it is titrable, well, it's the same ten trend with lower values because at Taulfo is the more acidic out of all the varieties, but we see the same trend. So the more unripe they are, the more acidic they are. We saw this at the time of consumption, and we saw the relationship between bricks and acidity, which is uh, we have this at 1950 heat units, so it's higher and it's a better relationship between uh, bricks and acidity. The better the relationship, the better balance between the sweetness and the acidic acidity of the fruit. And this is over 35. And we see that in the case of Kent, we have a value of 120. So pretty much is three times more compared to the minimum required by the standard. For Kit, we see something very similar. I'm going to jump a little bit. Uh, and we are going to go to 2021. So what did we do in 2021? We saw the two orchards in Nayarit, in Sinaloa, for the four varieties. And what do we see here? So the orchards here uh, for Ataulfo in Nayarit, it's larger than Ataulfo in Sinaloa specifically talking about the orchards. But what's the most important thing here? We are looking at the growth through the accumulation of heat units. And again, we see the trend, the higher the heat units, the better the growth of the fruit. And we see that in the four different varieties and in some cases, for example, with Kent, right here, the Kent from Nayarit is larger than the Kent that we obtained in Sinaloa. But the trend is that the more heat units, the greater the length. And the same thing applies for the diameter we see here for Tommy and uh, Kent, Kit. And so the higher, the lower, the values, but the trend is pretty much the same. So again, the higher the heat units, the greater the length of the fruit. And the content, the dry matter content we see here for Sinaloa, it was actually the opposite here. The product from Sinaloa had more dry matter in general terms compared to those from Nayarit. But at the end of the day, the trend was pretty much 
trying to get a value and we didn't really observe the prior values here because we did the sampling before harvest and for harvest one and harvest two but in general terms it's very similar and here we see once again the size of the fruit so what happens at 1750 heat units uh, for ataulfo we have a greater amount of larger fruit and if you see this here we have 18 16 14, 12, and we also get to fruit that is um, size 10, and it's about a 450 grams, which is actually very large for Ataulfo. And let's look at what happened here with uh, 1600 heat units. We had fruit that was 18, 20, 22, and they are smaller fruit. So in general terms, we observe the same for Tommy, Kent, and Keat. Well, in regards to quality for 2021, we see that for this year, 2021, we see the pop color at the beginning or at the time of harvest and then for consumption. And in general terms, we see that the color is less intense at time of harvest. And again, at least you should have a level two or level three from the table we saw before and get to a good value for consumption, which according to the National Mango Board is a level five. And we see the same trend. Now, when it comes to acidity, it's the same thing. It's a higher value. Let's look at the values from Ataulfo from upwards of three. And at the time of consumption, we go to 0.7. So that's why it's pretty much impossible to eat an Ataulfo mango at the time of harvest, even if it's physiologically ripe, because the acidity value is too low. And then we go to Tommy and we go for the relationship between uh, breaks and acidity. And then we have the same information for Kent and for Keat. And in general terms, when it comes to the growth and the quality characteristics, again, the more heat units, uh, it's uh, the better and greater values that you will see when it comes to length, diameter, size, dry matter, and quality of the fruit. Well, so what do, did we do when we built our model? Remember that I was telling you that for every single variety, we had 200 pieces of fruit from unripe to ripe fruit. And out of those 200 values uh, with the two degrees of ripeness and the four different varieties, they allowed us to build this model. And for dry matter, we obtained a 0.84 value and for soluble solids, a 0.91. Now, according to literature, for a model to be trustworthy, it should have an R and square R of 0.7 at least. So it means that we are complying with those expectations and we develop this single model for the four varieties. So what happened? Once we tested the model, we saw here a comparison of the four varieties, the two different states and the two harvests. So what do we see here? With the equipment, we obtain a 15.6 value for the equipment and for all varieties and 15.2 for the furnace. And with this equipment, it took us 20 seconds, seconds non-destructive, and we obtained this average value, which where we obtain a minimum of 13.8 and a maximum of 17.4. And the value that we obtained with the furnace, it actually took us three days to obtain that value. And it's 
giving us a difference between the equipment and the furnace of only 0.4%. Percent. So that means that the prediction from the model was very accurate, and we can definitely continue to improve it as long as we continue to obtain more data. But this is the first approximation, and again, the difference of 0.4% is very meaningful. So what happened when we did it? per every single variety. And in this case, we have a Taulfo, and you can see that we obtained a 15.9 with equipment and 15.6 with the furnace and only a 0.3% difference. And here we obtained an R square of 0.64. So we have here the 400 values for Ataulfo, for the two different states, for the two um, levels of ripeness, and that's the difference that we obtained. So that means that for Ataulfo, the model was more accurate compared to the other varieties. In fact, here uh, in Tommy's case, we see a difference of 0.2%. And then up here, we see 0.38, so that's a little lower. So it continues to be accurate with average values, but it's the uh, different with the other values. So what happened with Kent? Well, in Kent's, we saw a difference of 0.5%, and in R squared, a little bit above 0.39. So these values can be improved with more information and as we generate more data and our data will and our predictions will be more accurate with more data. And then finally, we have here what happened with KEAT. And with KEAT, we saw a little bit more spread, 0 0.6 percentage points uh, between the instrument and the furnace. So what can we say? We can say that this tool, the spectrometer, non-destructive spectrometer, can give us a certain reliability and our ability to predict the dry matter content of the fruit. So that means we have an additional tool that can be useful for determining the optimum harvest point. And particularly uh, important to us is that it's non-destructive. With the samples that we took to look at the flesh color and the bricks levels uh, as done in the packing house, we could say that 5% of the 300,000 tons imported annually to Mexico, and, and really 5% of 300,000 tons is about 15,000 tons annually of loss uh, with through destructive sampling. So this is a tool that can be very useful for the industry, for growers and packing houses uh, who work with fresh mango. So at the end of the day, what were our conclusions? Well, we can conclude that the accumulation of dry matter was proportional to the increase of heat units, accumulated heat units at harvest. As I was saying, greater the heat units, greater is the growth and greater is the quality measured by soluble solids, the, the bricks acidity relationship and color. Also, we saw greater quality, particularly in these, with regard to these four variables that I mentioned and that were positively impacted. I repeat that we see with greater heat, heat units, greater quality, greater development, greater weight, greater size. If we combine these technologies, accumulated heat units and non-destructive technology for dry matter, we can obtain just with putting off 
the harvest for seven to 10, to 10 days, we could gain up to two tons per hectare in terms of yield. Now, in terms of fruit size that is gained by putting off harvest, delaying harvest for seven to 10 days to the maximum heat unit, we will have larger sizes. And those larger sizes mean up to $2 per box, which results in an increase in the price at the sale point. And consumers will be fully satisfied that they're consuming a mango that in addition to all of the positive characteristics that we've seen, it has carotenoids, it has soluble solids, it has a good color, it also has a good flavor. And that's the most important thing for the consumer. The consumer will be satisfied with what they're consuming. And lastly, with the modification to the single model, we have a heat unit technique along with the non-destructive method that really gives us a more precise technology to be able to determine the proper harvest point for any of the four varieties, export varieties that we work with. So this model should be so robust that it really should work for the varieties that I've mentioned and similar growth conditions. So definitely, if we have to do something different in a certain area, we would have to validate the information initially. But I do think that we are looking at a technology that thanks to the National Mango Board and thanks to the support that we have received over the last 10 years, we have been able to generate technology that will allow the National Mango Board to do its work better, which is to increase mango consumption. And for us to help deliver a good quality mango to the US market, to US consumers. Uh, in addition, I would also like to mention that this project was a very productive project. $50,000 were invested in two seasons, over two seasons. And in addition to the technical recommendations, we also had the opportunity to write a scientific article, to make two presentations in at international conferences, such as the American Society. We supported the National Mango Board in their extension workshops with eight presentations. We presented two keynotes in scientific, at scientific events. And we also created a technology transfer module for these technologies. We supported the training of young people. We worked on five theses and we also made this technology available for dry matter, the F751, combined with the heat unit technology. So with that, I will conclude my presentation. Here's my contact information. If you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me by phone, by WhatsApp. You can reach me by email. And if you're interested in looking a little more at the results, you can go to this uh, website and you can find most of the publications uh, that I have had in this area. So here are some photos of our beautiful Nayarit, San Blas, and other areas. And uh, at this point, I would be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Osuna. We have time for a few questions. 
We have a question from Laura Giraldo, who asks, Doctor, how did you determine the heat hours at the time of measuring dry matter? Well, simultaneously, we follow the heat units. How do we monitor heat units? Well, we installed that equipment called OVO, which is a temperature and relative humidity monitor. We placed it on the tree and it full flowering, we took these measurements. So in mango producing areas, we see two or three flowering points. And when we see the maximum, flowering point or any flowering. So I installed the equipment in December. I installed the equipment, monitoring equipment in December. And then we saw the maximum flowering on February 15th. So between starting on February 15th, I started the accumulation of heat units. I download the data with the software that comes with the equipment. I send the data to an Excel spreadsheet and I ask the software to calculate the heat units. And so we would there have 30 minutes for 24 hours. So 48 readings per day to calculate the heat units. And we do this based on a base temperature of 10. What does that mean? Well. At 10 degrees centigrade, mangoes neither gain nor lose. So that point, 10 degrees, it begins the accumulation of growth in dry matter, et cetera. So with the support of the National Mango Board, in previous studies, we have determined that Ataulfo and Tommy require 1600 heat units from that time of full flowering to reach stage two that we saw on the graph. In the case of Kent, they require 1800 and Keat require 2200. So what do we do? We have the capacity to look at the records for Kent, for example, we're gonna say that Kent starts flowering on February 15th. So on March 15th, March or April 15th, May 15th, so that's four months. Uh, so then we would be at around 1500 heat units. At 1500 heat units, if I look at the average of the last five days and my heat units, accumulated heat units accu during those five days are, is 15, what does that mean? If I have 1500 and I need to get to 1800, that would mean 300, I need 300 more. So if I'm seeing an increase of 15 on average per day heat units, what does that mean? It means we'd need 20 days to reach that optimal harvest point. So that's how we calculate the heat units. And we go out with the equipment to download the readings. So we do readings before the harvest and at the time of the two harvests that we did during 2021. Thank you very much, Dr. Osuna. We have another question. It says, if we harvest a Kent with dry matter of 12%, and let's say the travel time is 16% uh, for 30 days, what do we do with the fruit at the packing house? Do we wait for it to go up? and we manage uh, ripening with temperature and other elements. Unfortunately, well, I hope, I would wish we could do that, but unfortunately, uh, you'll remember I mentioned that mangoes are a climateric fruit. What does that mean? That means it needs to 
have a minimum physiological ripeness. And with the information that I presented, if I harvest Kents at 12% of dry matter, that is a piece of fruit that is not mature physiologically. It is not going to mature. It's not going to ripen. Perhaps it'll change color. It's likely to get softer, but it's never going to reach the values required by the consumer. So what do I mean by this? We need to harvest the fruit when it's physiologically ripe. And we, as we saw in the on the table, we can only harvest at two or three. If I harvest fruit at one, I'm harvesting immature fruit that is never going to reach the values necessary to satisfy customers. So dry matter, well, the dry matter at the time of harvest, it doesn't, it doesn't increase. If I have 16% at harvest, it will have 16% uh, when it reaches the consumer. It may uh, change color, it may get softer, and soluble solids may change because the fruit was physiologically ripe. If I harvest a fruit that is not physiologically ripe, uh, then we're really going to lose the market because that fruit will never, never ripen sufficiently. It won't have the flavor, the aroma, the other aspects that consumers want. So what happens when there's a lot of demand and we don't have fruit that is physiologically ripe. What does the buyer say? Well, just send me the fruit, but it's not ready. No, you send me the fruit. So that's precisely when we have those disconnects that that are difficult because if we tell if we give someone a mango that doesn't taste like a mango, what are they going to say? Well, they're they're going to buy papayas or Hawaiian pineapple, but they're not going to buy mangoes. So we really have to send a mango that has mango flavor. If we are able to maintain this quality throughout the chain, and if we harvest at the proper moment, then we will be able to deliver quality fruit to the customer. If we harvest unripe fruit, despite all of our work, we're going to be sending garbage to the market. That's the truth. Well, once again, Dr. Osuna, thank you so much. And um, with that, we will conclude our session today. We hope to see you again in future webinars. Have a great afternoon. Have a great afternoon. It was a pleasure.